All right, a little quick pass through here. We're, on, we're in chapter 2 of Ephesians. In chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, Paul praises God for his work in Christ. And then in chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, he reports his prayer for them, and then he elaborates on that in light of Christ's exaltation. So that brings us down to the end of chapter 1. Then in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, Paul speaks of God's power that was directed toward them in the grace of salvation. We talked about this last week. He tells them in the first three verses that they were dead in their transgressions and sins, but God in His mercy made them alive in Jesus Christ. They were saved by grace, not by their own effort, he says, not by works so that no one can boast. And this is a fundamental thing to grasp, is that our salvation is a gift from a gracious God. It is never something in which we boast because we somehow were uh, wise enough or you know, good enough or anything like that. We do not earn our standing before God. And we have to see that. Okay? We never think that what we're doing is we're achieving our status before God. That because I'm so good, God looks favorably on me. Then I'm working, working, oh, then I mess up, now I'm back down here. It is a gift of God, and Paul stresses that not only in Ephesians 2, but he stresses it elsewhere, as does the entire New Testament. So they're saved, he says, look, saved by grace, not by their own effort. They simply receive that grace through faith, and as a result, they're to, to exhibit the godly behavior that God planned for their lives. So we have been given this gift of salvation, taken from this situation of alienation. In Christ, we have been brought near and we have a response to that. We are to live in response to that. We are to live grateful lives. We express that by living according to God's call on our lives. Living and expressing that in the behavior that God planned for our lives. And when we ended last week, we were looking at the chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. I remember to turn this on, so let's read that again. And then I'll pick up, I'll say a little bit about what I said last week. And then we'll pick back up where we left off. Chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Therefore remember that at one time, you, the Gentiles in the flesh, those called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, done by hands in the flesh, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who at one time were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, the one who made both groups one and broke down the dividing wall, which is the fence, having set aside in his flesh the hostility, the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, so that he might create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross, having put to death in himself the hostility. And having come, he proclaimed peace to you, those who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Accordingly, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself, in whom the entire building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a, into a place where God dwells in the Spirit. Okay, I want to just remind you a little bit about where we are in, in, in this section. Paul here, he calls them to remember God's saving work from the sp specific perspective of their past as Gentiles. So he wants them, he says, I want you to remember where you were as Gentiles, and he's doing that so they can have greater appreciation for their current standing in Christ. So we need to reflect on that. We need to remember where were we? What has God done for us? And if you say, well, I was raised in the church, well, think about what your life would have been without Christ. Okay? And I think about that in my own life. You know, where I, where I would be now if I had not become a Christian. And it's a, a sobering prospect. Well, in verses 11 through 13, Paul makes the point that as Gentiles, they were in a dire state of alienation. Okay, they were in a dire state of alienation prior to their conversion. But now that they're in Christ, they have been brought near 
through Christ's atoning death. In Christ Jesus, they've come to know Israel's Messiah. They've come to participate in God's promises to Israel and to have a relationship with the true and living God. All those things they did not have, Christ has brought them near and blessed them with those things. So he says, think about where you were. Think about what God has done for you. Then in verses 14 through 18, Paul explains that Christ unified Jews and Gentiles into one body. He transcended that fundamental division of the first century world. And it's hard for us to get a grip on that. But this was a huge gulf between Jews and Gentiles. Okay, but he bridged that. And that's a critical insight, and it's, very, it, it's a key, really, to what he's saying in, in the entire letter. He says, look, that he was able, that, that Christ unified Jews and Gentiles, and he did this by setting aside the Mosaic law through the sacrifice on the cross. The Mosaic law, as I talked about last week, it separated Jews and Gentiles. It did that in a number of ways, but a significant way in which it did that was through the extensive regulations regarding ritual uncleanness. Okay, you know from the Old Testament, all of these rules that made somebody ritually unclean. Okay, you had all of these rules that pertain to uh, involvement with certain animals, foods, bleeding, corpses, graves. Okay, there were these kinds of things that rendered a person ritually unclean, so that separated them from Gentiles because Gentiles were non-complying. They didn't think about that stuff. They didn't care about that stuff. So you couldn't be involved with them because they were unclean. So you couldn't go eat with them. Of course, there were specific prohibitions against marrying them, so it created this, this near complete isolation from them, and in that isolation there grew up great hostility. But a part of this, see, is these regulations dealing with the, with the uh, ritual uncleanness. Now, with the institution of the new covenant in Christ, the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, that was rendered obsolete, and that was, of course, in accordance with God's plan. This wasn't some surprise. This was all how it was playing out. But we have a new covenant that's instituted through Jesus Christ, and that institution of the new covenant then renders the old covenant the Mosaic Covenant, it renders that obsolete. And since that covenant is no longer operative, it's been rendered obsolete. The set or package of laws that were part of that covenant, the Mosaic Law, also was set aside, was no longer operative. Okay, so he, he does away with the Mosaic Covenant and through that does away with or sets aside the set or body of laws that were part of the Mosaic Covenant. And though the set of commands that constitute the Mosaic Covenant cease to be binding, many of the individual commands in that, in that set have an ongoing applicability, and indeed they find their full fulfillment in the New Covenant. And I think it's important to grasp that idea. See, that's why Paul, he says here in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, Christ has set aside the Mosaic Law, and then in chapter 6, he'll turn around and command them to honor their mother and father, right out of the Ten Commandments. And you see other places where he'll sit here and tell them not to engage in idolatry and many, many other things. Okay, so you can't sit here, sometimes you sit here and say, well, well, that's Old Testament. But you can't do that, you see. It's more complicated than that. Many of these, these particular laws, commands, that are part of that set of the Mosaic Law, they continue in, under the new covenant and form part of what we know as the law of Christ. And one of the ways to think about it, I, I was trying to see how to get, a, get this across, and this is maybe not the best parallel, but it's something like, you know, I'm no longer under Florida law, but the Arizona law that I am under contains many of the same laws that were in Florida. I see, it, it's something to understand, something uh, about that, you see, that... that this law of Christ, there are certainly binding moral requirements in Christianity. They're everywhere. Just read the New Testament. So this idea that somehow moral requirements are sub-Christian is just confusing. It makes no sense. And so what I'm, what I'm explaining to you, I'm telling you how I understand this. Okay, now I was, I was so rudely interrupted by the bell last week when I was saying that See, the fundamental ethical requirement of Christianity, the bullseye, the heart of Christian ethics is love. 
Okay, that is the center of Christian ethics. You can see that in texts like Matthew 7, 12, Matthew 23, 37 through 40, Romans 13, 8 through 10, Galatians 5, 14. But see, when you say that, people say, okay, well, that means there's no content to it. That's not true. The center is love, but some specific conduct is loving, and some conduct isn't. Love is the center, you see, but there are definite requirements on how love expresses itself. It's not like you say, well, it's all about love. Oh, I'm committing adultery because we're in love. You see, it's not like that. It's not this wax nose that you can move around that has no objective content. You see, love has definite content to it. As Paul indicates in Romans 13, 9, he says there, the command to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, that's the command, love your neighbor as yourself. But that encompasses the commands of the law. Okay, those commands come through. It encompasses the commands not to commit adultery, not to murder, not to steal, not to covet. And other commands that he doesn't specify. Okay, so love is the center, but there is objective content to love, and through that come many of the specific commandments of the law. But you're not under the law, you're not under the set of commandments, and that's an important thing to understand. So the Christian, though, not being under the Mosaic law, under that set of commandments that were part of the Mosaic covenant, upholds the transcendent moral requirements that were included in the Mosaic law. Okay, so we, we fulfill the law in that sense. The ongoing moral law centered in love is what is referred to as the law of Christ. You see Paul using that in 1 Corinthians 9, 21, Galatians 6, 2, and read Galatians 6, 2, especially with Galatians 5, 14, and you see the idea. And you can see there's some kind of distinction between the commands of the law. In 1 Corinthians 7, 19, where Paul says, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping the commands of God is what counts. You go, what? Circumcision was a command of God. Ah, but there's some distinction, you see. So he says, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing. Those things don't apply, but keeping the commands of God. We can't just sit there and say, well, that, that's, that's law. That's old stuff. Obeying God, who cares about that? I'm just kind of in the amorphous, vague uh, arena of love that has no requirements. Okay, I think that's, that's wrong. There are definite requirements. Okay, now because the commands of the Mosaic law relating to circumcision, sacrifices, the priesthood, feasts, holy days, ritual purity laws, food laws... All of these things you can see are not part of the law of Christ. They're not something the Christian is required to obey other than as an accommodation. Okay, there are times when love would require you to do that. But Christians aren't required to obey those things other than as an accommodation. And so you can see that, 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 that see, those things are gone. So those things you see that were such a source of separation between Jews and Gentiles are not applicable. They don't come through. They're not part of the law of Christ. So Christ ends those things that created the barrier between Jews and Gentiles. And in that way, that's what he means when he says, listen, by breaking this down, by setting aside the Mosaic law, he created one new man out of Jew and Gentile. This is how he did it. Because what comes through in the new covenant are not those rules of ritual uncleanness that were such a barrier. So in setting aside the Mosaic law, he has brought the two, Jew and Gentiles, into one. Now this is so important because his ultimate, uh, the end is what? In, in, in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, is the cosmic reconciliation. Okay, that is, his, that is what he's bringing about. Heaven and earth, all things, brought together at peace, in harmony, functioning perfectly. So here he has Jew and Gentile, he's brought them together and it's a foretaste of that. It is a foretaste of that, and we're going to see more about that. I don't know how far we'll get, but uh, there's just some mind-blowing stuff to me. When he talks about that, you know, we're a token or an expression, a symbol of, of you know, saying a message to the heavenly beings about this, okay? But, he, but Christ, he not only created, now he says, not only created one new body out of Jewish and Gentile believers, 
Okay, so he's done that by setting aside this Mosaic law, which was a barrier in its ritualistic aspects in particular. It was a barrier. So he sets that aside, and he makes this one new person out of Jews and Gentiles. But he not only did that, he also reconciled the one body with God by having atoned for the sin that alienated both Jew and Gentile from him. So he has reconciled. He has not only ended horizontal hostility, and he has brought Jew and Gentile together, he has also ended vertical hostility by atoning for the sin that separated both Jew and Gentile. Do you see his reconciling work, his peace-creating work? This is what he's doing, and it will find its fulfillment ultimately in cosmic reconciliation. We are the foretaste of that. And so he brings them together in one, and he reconciles as one to God the Father. And he does that in his flesh. He, he puts to death this hostility and this reconciling work is an already foretaste of the not yet universal reconciliation that he's talked about in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. So he's, Paul is saying here, but he, he, you see here, Christ proclaimed peace to Jew and Gentile. He says that in, in 17, having come, he proclaimed peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. He proclaimed Peace to Jew and Gentile, either, see it's not clear where he does this, he does it either through the event of his reconciling death, that that event itself was a proclamation, okay, that he was just talking about in verses 14 through 16, or he proclaims it through the spirit-empowered preaching that he commissioned uh, when he commissioned people to spread the gospel. Either way, he is preaching or proclaiming this peace to Jew and Gentile, and the same, that, that the same message of peace was proclaimed to Jew and Gentile is evident from the fact that both Jews and Gentiles have access to God as sharers of the one spirit. So that they have access as sharers of the one spirit is an indication that the same message was preached to them. Okay, it was proclaimed to them. Jews and Gentiles united in one body have access to the Father in one spirit. Okay, as put in verse 16, they both have been reconciled with God as one body. Do you see the unity? Do you see the overcoming of divisions and hatreds? And what a testimony that is to what Christ does. We don't understand that. We don't understand what a horrible thing division is in the body of Christ. How it counters the very message of Christ. Hey, this is just a trivial thing. And we got little pockets and factions and fighting and all this stuff. It's very significant. It's very significant. Because we are working against the message of what Christ achieved. We're countering that. And you can see it here where he says, Jews and Gentiles brought together in one body. Then verses 19 to 22 you see that we're members of God's household as a result of Christ's mighty reconciling work. See, these Gentiles who were outsiders, well, what are they now? Now they're insiders. They once were outsiders, now they're insiders. They're now fellow citizens with all other Christians in the kingdom of God. But then in more intimate terms, okay, not just as citizens in the, with, a, uh, with saints in the kingdom of God. He then speaks in more intimate terms. They're members of their heavenly father's household. You see, a part of his family, members of his household, as O'Brien says, he quotes a fellow named Towner, he says, in the Roman world of the day, to be a member of a household meant refuge and protection, at least as much as the master was able to provide. It also meant identity and gave the security that comes with a sense of belonging. See, this term of being part of God's household was loaded with refuge and protection, you were under his wings, you were, in his, you were with him. You're a member of his family. And Paul says that they've been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Okay, they've been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, meaning that their membership in God's people, it rests on the normative teaching that arises from divine revelation. God has revealed this. He has revealed truth and the gospel message, and the mystery to the apostles and prophets, and as they shared it with people, as they shared it with the Gentiles, okay, they have been brought from alienation to unity. They have been brought into God's household. They've been built on the foundation 
of the apostles and prophets. And he says, the cornerstone of this building into which these Gentiles have been incorporated is Christ himself. The cornerstone of this building, they're being brought together, they're being fitted together into a a unity, into a functioning, unified structure, a building. It's not a haphazard pile of debris. They are being built together in a unified structure. And the cornerstone of this structure is Jesus Christ. Now, in ancient times, the cornerstone was was not something, see, that was put into place on a completed building when it was dedicated. We'll do that. We'll build a building, you know, then we'll slap up something on the corner that says, you know, dedicated in so-and-so or paid for by somebody, that kind of thing. That's not what a cornerstone was in the ancient world. It was the first stone laid. Okay, it was the first stone laid and it set the line or standard by which the walls were constructed. Let me read to you, O'Brien. He says, Paul seems therefore to be making the following points. Christ is the vital cornerstone on whom the building is constructed. The foundation and position of all the other stones in the superstructure were determined by him. He is the one from which the rest of the foundation is built outwards along the line of the proposed walls. Accordingly, the temple is built out and up from the revelation given in Christ with the apostles and prophets elaborating and explaining the mystery which had been made known to them by the Holy Spirit. But all is built on Christ, supported by Christ, and the lion's shape of the continuing building is determined by Christ, the cornerstone. The church is built on him. He is the one who determines its shape. Okay, so this is, I mean, this idea of a cornerstone, I mean, we all know that. We would all say amen to that. But it's just neat to see it laid out, to have him talking about it this way. It's in Christ that previously divided people are brought to unity, which Paul here, he describes as they're being fit together into a building, into a unified structure. As I said, it's not a pile of bricks. It is a unified structure. So it's in Christ that this structure, the community of faith, it's in Him that this structure, the community of faith, winds up, it grows into a holy temple in the Lord. See, God dwells in the church as He dwelled in a special way in the temple. He dwells in the community of faith. As He dwelled in in a special way in the temple... But the church is a work in progress. It is a growing thing. You see, it's growing as a holy temple into a completed holy temple. So though it's a building, it's an organic structure. It is a holy temple that is growing into a completed holy temple. And these believing Gentiles are among those who are being incorporated into this construction project... Right? They're being added, they're being built in, having become part of the community in which God dwells in the Spirit. We have been added, we have been brought in. This project is ongoing. But we are brought into this unified structure. We are fitted together. Do you see? And so this whole theme, you see, of harmonizing, unifying, that Christ is ultimately doing to the cosmos. He is doing in the here and now in the body of Christ. And he's done it with these Gentiles. Chapter 3, you never thought we'd get there. I think Terry may turn out to be right. It may be 40 weeks, bro. It may be, I don't know. We just keep going, you see. Chapter 3, he says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, now he's going to digress. He's getting ready to to tell them about a prayer. But he says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, for surely you heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, that by revelation the mystery was made known to me as I already wrote in brief. By reading that, you're able to perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which mystery was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, that it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is... The Gentiles are joint heirs and members of the same body and sharers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I became a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me according to the working of his power. As I say, Paul here, he begins to tell them his prayer 
on their behalf in light of the tremendous blessings that he's just recounted for them in chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Uh, But then he quickly digresses and he'll pick back up with that in verse 14. Okay, he says, for this reason I, Paul, then he digresses. And then in verse 14, he'll pick back up with this prayer report that he's giving him. And he says he's a prisoner on behalf of the Gentiles. And he says that because it was was preaching of the law-free gospel to the Gentiles that led to his arrest in Jerusalem. And then it was imprisonment in Caesarea and ultimately to his imprisonment in Rome. Why why did that happen? It was because he was preaching this very message of a law-free gospel that the Mosaic law is not binding and Jew and Gentile are united together as one before God. Well, the Jews didn't like that. You see, he was dissing Moses. And so that ultimately, it was his role in preaching that gospel that led. So he tells him he's a prisoner on behalf of the Gentiles. And then in verses 2 through 7, he says he's a steward of, of, of the mystery on their behalf. He'd been given a stewardship. You know what stewardship is? You're entrusted with something. He'd been given a stewardship of God's grace for the Gentiles' benefit in that he had been entrusted with a commission to proclaim that grace. He'd been given a stewardship of grace in that he'd been given a commission to proclaim that grace to these Gentiles in the Gospels. And he assumes they heard of that fact. Okay, because he says, for surely you heard of the stewardship. That's part of the reason it makes me think that, it, that he's sending this to at least some people who aren't personally familiar with it. Okay, that he's sending it. It's, it's a letter to a group of churches in Asia Minor. It seems that at least some of these people aren't personally familiar with him because he says, for surely you heard of it. He assumes that, they, that they're aware of this. He assumes that they'd heard of that fact, and which, in, which implies that they don't have this personal uh, acquaintance with him. Now, that stewardship of God's grace was given to him when the mystery was revealed to him. Okay, he has this mystery that's been a mystery of God that's been revealed. And O'Brien, he notes in in 1, 9, and 10, in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, the mystery referred to God's all-inclusive purpose, which has as its ultimate goal the uniting of all things in heaven and earth in Christ. Here, a more limited dimension of the mystery focuses on Gentiles along with Jews being incorporated into the one body of Christ and thus participating in divine salvation. The one mystery is this large thing of Christ unifying and reconciling. In 9 and 10, you see it deals with the entire cosmos. But there is a more limited aspect of that, and he's focusing on that aspect of the larger mystery, and that's the unification of Jew and Gentile. Okay, so you have this here. The reconciliation of Jew and Gentile is part and parcel of this larger mystery of universal reconciliation that's been achieved in Christ. Okay, so it it is, is it, you know, are there many different mysteries? No, they're aspects of the one mystery. Okay, they're aspects of the one mystery. Now, Paul had already mentioned in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, and chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, The revelation of the mystery, 9 and 10, right? Cosmic reconciliation. He'd already mentioned the revelation of the mystery in its cosmic form, its broadest form in 9 and 10, and also in its more particular aspect in verses 11 through 22 of Jew and Gentile reconciliation. So he's already spoken of this mystery, and from that they should be able to to recognize his insight into the mystery of Christ, the mystery that is disclosed in Christ. Okay, the mystery that is disclosed, he's already mentioned it, 9 and 10, 2, 11 through 22, it's broader aspect, it's narrower aspect, that should give them some insight or ability to recognize or perceive Paul's insight. And that mystery, he says, wasn't revealed to people in prior generations, but it's now been revealed by the Spirit Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. You see the same thing. Okay, the same idea in Romans 16, 25 and 26, Colossians chapter 1, verse 25 to 27, that it wasn't disclosed before, but it's now been made known. This mystery of which he's speaking and what was concealed in prior generations, it wasn't the truth. Okay, it, it wasn't the truth that faith is the principle by which God will justify men and women, Gentiles as well as Jews. That wasn't what was, you know, hidden. Hidden. 
That was, you know, elsewhere, Paul makes clear that the gospel, it's not some new teaching, but it was promised in advance in the scriptures, in the Old Testament. Okay, the gospel's not some new teaching. That aspect of it, that faith is the basis on which he's going to reconcile people, both Jew and Gentile. You can see that in Romans 1, 2, Romans 3, 21, Romans 15, 8 through 12. That's not something new. In fact, in Galatians 3.8, he says the gospel was proclaimed beforehand to Abraham. Okay, that's not the mystery that he's talking about here. God's intention to bring the Gentiles into the blessing of the Jews is all over the Old Testament. That Jews were going to participate in some way in in the blessing of Israel is all over. You can see it, for example, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 43. Although if you look in the Revised Standard, New Revised Standard, or ESV, you may have trouble seeing how that's relevant since they take the word nations, Gentiles, and translate it heavens. Okay, and I didn't chase down whether that's some textual issue or what. But other, the other translations you'll see speaks of the nations and the Gentiles. But you can see it in Isaiah 11:10. Psalm 18, 49, Psalm 22, 27, and 28, Psalm 117, verse 1, and on and on. Okay, so that's, that was clearly understood that Gentile would participate with Jew in some way, shape, or form in sharing in blessings, but the mystery that was newly revealed related to the manner in which God's intention to bless the Gentiles with the Jews would come to fruition. It dealt with the manner. Okay, how he was going to bring this about, it would not be by Gentiles joining Jews as faithful adherents of the Mosaic law. You see the early Jews, what were they saying? That's all right, they can come in, but they got to obey the law of Moses. Right, that's what was bugging them. They got, that, that's fine, I understand, I understand that there's going to be, the, but they've got to come in and be adherents of the law of Moses. All of the ritual requirements, all of circumcision, food laws, all of that, they got to do that. Mm -mm. You see, no. You see, so the mystery relates to the manner in which God is going to, uh, is going to bless the Gentiles with the Jews. It wouldn't be that way. It wouldn't be by Gentiles joining Jews as adherents of the Mosaic law. Rather, it would be by the Messiah setting aside the Mosaic law, breaking down that dividing wall, so that Jews and Gentiles would be made into a unified body, a spirit-forged entity, a family of full and equal members. That is what the church is. You see, a family of full and equal members, Christians, in fact, by the second century, Christians would speak of themselves as a third race or a new race, neither Jew nor Gentile. That's how they referred to themselves, you see, because those things had gone and something entirely new had been created. A new body had been created of reconciled Jew and Gentile participating as a spirit-forged family of full and equal members. And the message here, you see, you see in, in Corinth, by the way, when they're taking the Lord's Supper... We, uh, we miss this a lot, but one of the things that they're doing is they're stratifying on economic grounds. They are stratifying the body of Christ, and we don't, you know, partly because of Christianity's influence on our culture, it's hard for us to grasp sometimes how people could stratify so much on economic bases. You know, sit here and say, well, look, I'm of this class, and you're dirt. You say, you're down here, I've got more money, I have this position, I have this. And they were doing that during the Lord's Supper. And you see how counter that is to what Christ has done. You see, that's why it's so important to Paul. Because Christ has brought all different groups into one. He has forged us into this body. Now the content of the now revealed mystery, this more limited dimension or aspect of this now revealed mystery, the content is spelled out in verse 6, by entering into Christ, through receiving the gospel, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs with Jewish believers, members with Jewish believers of the one body of Christ, and sharers together with Jewish believers in the promise. Ah, I hear it. 
All right, so you see, he spells that out in Paul. He then says he had the great honor of becoming a servant of this glorious gospel, a missionary to the Gentiles. He had the great honor of becoming a servant of this gospel, a missionary to the Gentiles, as a result of God's gracious commission to him. Now that commission was according to God's power, in the sense that God gave Paul the power appropriate to the ministry to which he was appointed. Okay, in other words, God not only graciously called him to this grand task he had set before him, he also graciously empowered him for that task. And the rest is history, as they say. I mean, what did Paul do? I mean, Paul upset the world. Right? He went out preaching this message, this law-free gospel, this message of Christ's atoning, reconciling work, creating this one new man, all groups, all people, come home, baby, into one family. No longer the, the looks and the division and the looking down and separating. One family, all united, loving, giving, serving. Christ did it. Christ did that. And then his call here, is to, his call is to make the mystery known and I'm not going to have time to do this, obviously. But let's read it. He says, To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the good news of the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten everyone as to what is the plan of the mystery that for ages was hidden in God who created all things in order that the richly diverse wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms through the church. This was according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. I ask you therefore not to be disheartened by my sufferings on your behalf, which is your glory. I got to keep talking until he rings the bell, okay? If I, this stuff, I'm saying, though he was the very least of all the saints, he says that because why? He violently persecuted the church of God. Okay, you see him refer to himself that way in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. He was given by grace the glorious assignment of preaching to the Gentiles the good news of the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten people. Okay, he's, he's given the task of preaching to the Gentiles the good news of Jesus and to enlighten all people regarding the plan of the mystery that for ages was hidden in God who created all things. O'Brien, he says, as Paul fulfilled his commission of preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ to the Gentiles. So through this proclamation of the gospel, men and women came into a relationship with God through his son, the Lord Jesus. They were joined with Christ in his death and resurrection and so became fellow members along with Jewish Christians of the same body. In this way, the previously hidden mystery described in verse 6 was being implemented in a wonderful manner. God was putting into effect his age-old plan, something that had not been seen or imagined before. And as the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul had the great privilege of revealing this magnificent divine administration to the eyes of human beings on earth, Jew and Gentile alike, all. Paul's commission then contained this second element, not as something additional or unrelated to the proclamation of the gospel, but integral to it. In preaching the gospel to Gentiles and bringing them into this unity, bringing them into this one body, he was enlightening the world about God's purposes by doing that. But he wasn't only enlightening the world. He was preaching to the heavenly beings. You see, the, the church does that. The purpose of his preaching to the Gentiles and the consequent enlightening of all people regarding the nature of God's previously unrevealed mystery was that the richly diverse wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms through the church. Okay, the, the purpose of his preaching to the Gentiles, bringing them in and therefore enlightening everybody, was what? It was so that they might, he, that God's, multifaceted, complex, multifaceted wisdom that is represented by the church, by this, by this unified, multiracial, multiethnic community that is joined into one body 
that that message might be proclaimed to the heavenly beings. This is what God has done in Jesus Christ. The church's existence proclaims that message to heavenly beings. And we want to fight. We want to divide. Do you see how insane it is? We're, we're throttling the message. All right, I'm through. I heard that bell. Thank you. <laughs>